Um, thank you so much for showing up on, is this the last talk of the day? And you're still here, you're not at the bar, you're listening to me, that's touching. Yes, I will try to make it good. This talk is called The Four Types of Locks, and it shall become clear, hopefully, in a second what I mean, because a lot of people who've seen me speak before, they say, man, I've seen more than four types of locks in your pockets, let alone like what you carry in these, there's a million types of locks. And what I mean by this is, no, it's not about styles and designs of lock, it's really helpful to think of locks in four really broad categories. It's the best way, in my opinion, to try to build a physical security framework for yourselves. And I'm actually cobbling around in my own noggin up here what could become a physical security framework for companies because the standards out there are really, really abysmal. In case you don't know, you haven't seen me bouncing around at different conferences, I sort of show up in random odd places and do a lot of things with locks and physical security. You can usually tell by how I'm dressed where, where you're seeing me. If you're seeing me in like nice shirt mode, I'm with my company, the core group, you know, wearing pants and things like that. But yes, we do auditing and physical assessment and training and lock forensics for proper companies. If you see me in black t-shirt mode, I'm with Tool running some sort of hands-on workshop or other fun play area, teaching your kids how to get out of handcuffs and things like that. And I always enjoy, when how many people have come by one of the Tool areas and actually tried some picking at events? Excellent. We will have a whole lockpick village going on here at Source tomorrow. So all the things you're seeing today, you will not only learn how to do it from me, you'll learn how to do it yourselves, hands-on, here in this exact conference. Fun. I also, as I was joking with Gadsden earlier, I do a lot of fun stuff with firearms. Uh, I'm very into physical security of that nature. I travel with firearms a lot, and that became a whole other field of expertise, and I learned way more than I ever thought I would learn about how airlines and highways and all the different laws work. So if you ever travel with firearms or you want to, talk to me later. It's in a bar. Like, I'll tell you a million fun things. It's not hard. It's actually sometimes really, really cool. That's a different talk of mine. But we're here today to talk about locks. We're here to talk about which locks are which, which ones are good. Here's a bunch of locks that look very similar, the popular square body padlock all on a shelf. These are different brands. Are they the same inside? Are they different? How do you know when a lock is high security? What does that even mean? Here we have a nice selection of high, do you think these locks are very high security, right? Yeah, they're badass. Put them on your server room, you'll, you'll be great. Um, yes, why do locks matter and why do we distinguish between them? Why do we need to know this? Well, it comes down to the job you're trying to do. Every one of you, or most of you, I imagine, are responsible for a lot of pieces of equipment that look like this, and you have to secure them and configure them correctly and patch everything and make sure all your networks are segmented just right. And you can be doing all of that, probably helping your company out a lot, and I respect all the work you do. If you or someone else at your company didn't pay attention to locks, however, I can stroll in with a console cable on a red team audit and really ruin your day. You could have all the you know, phone calls between your different offices through crypto you know, connections and your, well, your PBX is talking to your San Francisco PBX and it's all locked down. I still guarantee you somewhere in your office, there's a room that looks like this with a bunch of copper just going up to everyone's desk. If I get into this room with you know, some alligator clips and a butt pack, all those crypto phone calls suddenly are belong to us. It's not really helping you out. Your physical security is your data security and vice versa. All of your hard work, everything you're doing or everything your boss is doing or everything you know, your associate team is doing, all of this that you do here is great. Don't let it get ruined here by really bad decisions walking through Home Depot. That's the crux of what I'm gonna tell you about today. There are four grades of locks and I kind of categorize them in different ways. The first grade that I talk about is quote, the lowest grade of lock or the locks you are most likely using where you don't realize it. How bad are a lot of these locks and how prevalent are they? Well, it's pretty rotten. You may not know, hey sweetie, that most of the, the, the locks you use, whether they are you know, deadbolts, doorknobs, padlocks, they look very different, but you guys should understand they're all the same lock inside. These are all just different form factors of what's called a pin tumbler lock. In the, in the, here in North America, it is the most common lock everywhere. Inside what's actually happening, because you're going to learn this right now, you're actually not going to just get a quick spiel, you're going to learn picking itself. Woohoo! Inside what's actually going on, well, this round part that turns when you're operating the lock is called the plug. And if you look just right down the keyway, you know, peer into some of these, you know, locks around, don't like mess with them, but just look into locks or like look into locks that you might have in your room, you'll probably even see a little piece of a pin. Many of you do know, and you've heard the term pin tumbler lock, you might know that locks work with pins somehow. 
What you'll never see, however, unless you completely strip the lock apart, and imagine we cut the face right off this, inside of a pin tumbler lock, it's not a single pin doing a job usually, it's a pair of pins called a pin stack. So right now, this plug can't turn if we don't put a key in it because the pin stack is not in the right position. Shown in blue is called the driver pin, and that pin is binding right now. It's only if you stick your key into the lock, your key rides along the key pin, shown in red, pushes on the pin stack just the right amount, lets everything turn nice and even and clear. That's the same design that Linus Yale created back in the UK ages ago, and we still use it today. That is all that's happening in most of your locks. Does this make sense so far? Excellent. You're like halfway to being a locksmith at this point. Now, of course, it's not a single pin stack in the lock. There are a series of them. The more you have, usually people are like, oh, there's more security because I got more pins. Well, yes and no. All the driver pins are the same in this lock, but notice the key pins are different sizes. The different size key pins correspond to different heights on the blade of the key, known as the bitting of the key. That's how a key is different from another key, is different from somebody else's key. All those cuts represent different sizes of bottom pin, of key pin, that have to be distinct and accurate. And of course, if just one of those pins is a little off, oh, well, I'll show you that in a second. Sorry. So inside the lock, you've seen diagrams, you've seen some animations, but you've never really seen a photo until now. And unless you've carved a lock open, you've probably never seen this with your own eyes. Understand that this is supposed to be a beautiful and you know, supremely perfect world where everything is lined up, everything's measured just right. Ideally, that's how the lock would work, flat and true and even and flush every time. Actual locks, as anyone who's worked in the hardware space knows, anything you manufacture, you send out to a fab lab, you pay for tolerances. You pay for how accurately your milling and machining is going to be. All locks will have some imperfection in the actual production process. So these chambers that are drilled to hold the pin stacks, they're not perfect in every way. These pins weren't milled beautifully, and it looks like a couple of them have even seen better days. The plug chambers also can be a little sloppy, a little bit different size, different alignment. All of these imperfections line up and cause the lock to not behave in that gorgeous, pristine, sort of animated way you just saw. Here's another animation. Imagine we've stripped the lock completely apart. So the plug has been removed, and it's on the left side here. We're looking at it kind of down from above. All those chambers, right where they should be, perfectly drilled. And again, we're trying to turn this plug with no key. All those driver pins are binding, 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 as they should, right? But think about those imperfections that I just described to you. Think about how many locks are not this good. In fact, no lock is perfect, perfect. Some come close, but some locks are really bad. Some locks, I mean, this is, you know, misaligned, a little bit wrong shape. You think this is exaggerated, sort of, to make it visually appealing, and maybe it is, but not in all instances. Really cheap locks, absolutely, you can just look at them, naked eye, and be like, oh, God, who milled this? Those imperfections cause the binding process to not happen universally across all the pin stacks. So whatever pin is the most misaligned, like the one that's really hanging out further, that one hits first, and the rest of these pins aren't binding, even though we're trying to turn the plug. Does that make sense? Well, because of that, because locks will bind one pin stack at a time, you can attack them one pin stack at a time. It comes back to what I said, how more pins is not necessarily more secure. Someone might say, well, I'll have a really big key space because I'll make a lock that's like seven pins deep. And there are some seven pin locks. I've seen eight pin locks. Beyond that, it just gets silly because it looks like you're carrying a sword around on your keychain. <laughs> And also because you're not really buying yourself more security. Yes, your key space is huge. It's unlikely that your key would ever accidentally line up with some other guy's key. But just in terms of resisting attack, more pins isn't really doing it for you. With binding pins setting one at a time, you can do what's called manually setting the pins into position one at a time. A little bit of pressure on the plug. Let's resume this again. A little bit of pressure will cause a pin, of course, to bind somewhere. If you then put lifting force on the pin stack, you'll eventually click it into position where it should have been. You'll, you know, it has nowhere else to go. It's going to eventually just reach the height that it should have reached with the proper key. When you reach that height, this pin stack is no longer binding, and the plug actually can turn a little bit. It can't open, but it can turn just enough to hang up that driver pin. Does everyone see that? The driver pin actually gets caught on the lip of the plug. And now, 
When it's turned a little bit, now the next most misaligned pin somewhere else is the next one to bind. But as long as you keep very gentle pressure on the plug, that driver that you have set is never going to fall back down into the keyway. You've taken it out of the equation, and you can go through the whole lock, pop, 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 hunting around, trying to find which pins are binding, and eventually get them all. It's really, really simple. So here we have a lock with a plug under pressure, lifting, and those didn't feel like much, but this pin stack, you felt a little click. You're like, ooh, that's interesting. These are loose. Here's a little tight, and you feel a click. So you're hunting around always, trying to find the tight binding pin stack and push it gently until it clicks. And when you eventually click, 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 get the last one, now everything is open because nothing is holding the plug shut anymore. You all, I swear to you, you all can do this. You will be amazed at how easy it is. There's another technique known as raking. Raking is even simpler to do if you've ever seen certain pick tools that have kind of squiggly tips on the end of them. Raking is just scrubbing back and forth across all the pins. It's kind of like fuzzing the lock. You're trying to just you know, throw everything you got at it and see what craps out. And a lot of the times, raking will pop a lock open even faster than that lifting method. Don't you know, take my word for it, because what is a good con talk without potential live demo fail? We'll try to, we'll try to do this right in front of you here. Hopefully, uh, these really poor brands, which I'll cover that up. You know, it's, it's a blaster <laughs> padlock. Yes, so hopefully you know, these locks will behave properly enough for us that we can see. And just you know, yell at me if I'm on camera. I'm no Scorsese. I can't line up a shot at all. Only two tools I'll need, a tensioning tool, that's going to just put a little bit of pressure on this plug. And again, you're not like, Ur, you're not cranking down on it. Gentle, just I'm going to lean this right into my hand. Can everyone see the tensioner? Just kind of laying in my hand. That's more than enough pressure. A little hook tool, and I'm just going to go in and try to reach these pins. And if it was quiet enough, that's a loud fan in that projector, you might even hear them clicking. Maybe some of you up front would if I was shutting my mouth. Absolutely, you can do that. Absolutely not hard. Raking, same idea. Here's a lock out of a deadbolt. I'm going to go in, same idea. Tensioner tool, very gentle pressure. Not going to use my hook. I'm going to grab a rake tool instead. And just vary your effort. Vary your pressure up, vary your angles. There we go, all right. Look, look a little longer that time, but again, just open. You are all gonna do this. You're absolutely all gonna do this. And what's more, these are locks you're all using probably somewhere. Don't rely on them and think of these as magical, you know, impenetrable devices. They're really not. Another type of lock you have around your company, it's not a pin tumbler lock, but I'm sure you've got them, wafer locks. Incredibly popular in pre-built office furniture, in cabinets, all kind of things. Wafer locks are even simpler than pin tumbler locks, and it's one more just no-brain lock. It's just a sliver of metal. It's not even a split piece of you know, one pin, another pin. It's one piece of metal in the plug that can't be too low, can't be too high, just kind of has to line up right in the middle, and then it turns. I can't even tell you a sophisticated finesse way of attacking these other than just to say, rake them or use what are called jiggler tools on them. A jiggler tool, shown here in the middle and the top, it's essentially like almost a rake and a tensioner all in the same package. Practically, if the locks are bad enough, as most locks are, here's a filing cabinet lock. Jiggler tools, I mean, you can almost use them as keys, like old keys that have worn out. You have to bang around and be rough with them. Let me see if I can do this on camera. All right, that's, I don't know if you can see that, but that's open. <laughs> yeah, and this, is, this has got a lot, there's like five wafers in here. That's a lot. There are four wafer, there's three wafer locks. I've seen a two wafer lock once on a power panel. So yeah, don't use that lock, please. These are all examples of that first grade of do not use this lock, lock. But of course we are using these locks. We're using locks like this sometimes. I saw this on a wiring closet once. Common master combo padlock, who's seen it? You all have, who, who has used it? Who uses it at the gym? I know you're saying, Deviant, you don't know what a gym is, you don't know what they have there. <laughs> Right. Do you know that you can open these? You guys, some of you must know, you can open these with beer can metal. Has anyone seen this before? Who has not seen this before? Okay, for those of you who haven't seen this before, let me try to keep everything on camera here. This is a piece of metal from a beer can. I'm going to make a few cuts in it and a little pattern here. Uh, 
All right, I'm gonna make a quick fold. You're all gonna learn how to do this in the village tomorrow too. A little bent piece of metal, I'm gonna go into this block, slip it in, down, twist and turn. Yeah, don't use this lock for anything other than your dirty socks at the gym. Yes, beer can do anything. Has anyone ever heard of the bumping attack? Yes? Anyone ever not heard of bumping? It's finally getting some, some word in the news. Bumping relies on basic Newtonian physics, like you all learned in high school. You slap a cue ball into the billiard stack, the two goes flying. That's what happens inside of a lock when someone's using a locksmith pick gun. If you've ever seen in TV shows, the snap, 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 or maybe you've had a lockout call. A guy comes to let you in your apartment. It might have been what he tried to use. A snapper gun just smashes on the bottom pins of a lock, smashes the key pins, gets the top pins to fly up. A bump key is a specially cut key that does the same thing. You smash on the key from the outside, it bangs into all the pins, potentially driving the drivers up. You can even try to do this on camera, why not? You're getting all the, uh, the we have had no epic fail yet. Isn't this amazing? Makes, that, that, I'm like, I'm completely screwing all the other speakers who have live demo because I'm getting all the good karma and then everything else is just gonna wreck the rest of the weekend. Sorry guys. So here we have a lock, the bump key. Now this key does not, you know, open the lock. It's not bitted for this lock at all. But if I take a good, uh, good bump hammer here and just kind of get my hand in position, and whack with it. There we go, that's, that's open. Not open, open. Every one of you can do this. Where are you using these locks? Well, unfortunately, you're using these everywhere. Anything that's listed as a ruggedized lock for outdoor purposes is usually really bad. It's usually designed to weather the elements. It's not designed to protect from these sorts of attacks. And of course, this lock in a great neighborhood of town can control the entire power of a building. And it's an awful, terrible lock. You know, power panels, all type of wafer locks on access panels, power panels, wiring panels. These are all crummy, pre-built locks. Locks that came with something you bought, did not ever think to replace because whoever thinks of that. And just because you hired a locksmith at your facility to you know, secure the front door, and that's great, I applaud you if you've done that. You probably still have a lot of really lousy locks laying around. And if someone can run a red team test on you and get in the building, usually with a wink and a smile, not even with my lock picks, once someone's in the building, if they're not being challenged, why, why are you in here, there's a lot someone can really do. Why are most locks this bad? It's a little outside the scope of this, but if you're curious, it has to do with standards. Uh, most standards of locks, particularly in North America, are very industry-led. They're very, you know, the industry rating itself. And almost all of them pertain to matters of brute force attack. Locks are you know, rated against how many foot-pounds of torque can you turn them with without cracking them in, how, how much you know, can you kick the door. Things like bumping, picking, even shimming, they're really not in these lock standards. You know, picking is an instantaneous attack. The, some standards will say, all right, this must, this must resist you know, 15 minutes of attack, or this must resist 15 minutes of bumping. I don't even know what that is, personally. If a bump attack's gonna work, it's gonna work in five seconds. You're not gonna sit there hammering on the, a bump attack for 15 minutes involves a sledgehammer, I think. <laughs> but yeah, the idea that, oh, our lock is resistant for up to 15 minutes, that's pretty poor. If someone can just breeze through the door like that because a lock is this bad, you know, it's, it's just gonna happen in a, in a heartbeat. It's not, really, it's not really being looked at the right way in terms of standards, in my opinion. You need some kind of response window for someone to wake up and say, oh, shoot, someone's here. You need a lock that will actually resist more and will, will really slow someone down. So what, how do you get that? How do you make locks kind of better? What is the next category of lock that I would say is type two? Well, pick resistant locks are out there. Many times you hear about, you know, this lock is hardened or this lock is commercial grade or this is blah, blah, blah. Those are all just marketing terms. I personally have very specific categories from which I would say this is pick resistant. For one thing, making keyways a little tighter, making keyways harder to move your tools around in. The more warding you have, the more angular a keyway is, that's definitely going to frustrate most attacks. This is a real keyway. You know, it costs more to make, but it, sure it exists. We can do keyways right. We just don't because everyone has, well, I've seen this key forever. And can you make me three more locks on this key? The same KW1 and SC1, those two keys, the Schlage and Quickset keys, there's a bajillion of them out there. 
And we're going to keep seeing more of them. Why? Because people say, oh, I've got 12 of these locks and I want to have three more. I should key it all the same. Unfortunately, it's not really good thinking. Inside the locks, you can absolutely prevent that shimming attack. If you're worried about kids with beer cans running around, opening all your power panels, you just get an unshimmable padlock. They're out there. I'm a fan of them. But how often do you see this talked about? So when you buy it as a consumer, if you're not thinking of this, you're never going to say, by the way, is this lock shim proof? Finally, again, this is making its way onto some packaging nowadays. The double ball mechanism, the idea of other types of mechanisms that can't be just popped open. That's a good thing. I'd like to see more of it. You can change the shape of pins and make them a lot harder to pick. As many of you might be able to predict this, just looking at the physics of what's about to happen. If you try to you know, set this pin, it's called a spool pin. It's going to jam on the edge. It's not going to want to set. There are a number of designs like that. Mushroom pins, serrated pins jam on everything. Now, it's still possible to pick these with enough finesse, with enough real patience and dedication, but it's harder. It's a great step up. It is what makes this lock you know, pick resistant in my mind. Come on. There we go. You can resist bumping really easily. A simple way of doing that, you know, putting some gaps in the pin stack so the physics of bumping doesn't transfer energy correctly. There's even an anti-bump pin by making one pin less weighty than the other. It will actually mess up the physics of how the pins fly around. Uh, talk to me more in the Q&A if you really want to get into retrofitting and changing your locks. I'll tell you some tips about it. However, please understand that everything I've just shown you in Category 2, you can still get around it with dedication. This right here, this next step up, is what I really want most of you to try to take away from this talk. There is a difference between pick resistant and what I would call properly high security. There are whole different categories, whole di it's a whole different animal, but those sort of terms get thrown around a lot because of marketing you know, guys who say, let's put this high security display over here. And you saw it was like you know, commercial grade master locks. Find enough lock if you want to, you know, keep the two-year-old out of the candy, I guess. But it doesn't belong in your server room. What do I consider a proper high security lock? Well, it's something that would entirely change the game. Something that someone who bought the $5 pick set or the $10 pick set online with like three tools in it cannot get into. Something you need specialized tools to attack. Something that needs different training and techniques and different methods beyond just the basics that you can learn like on the internet. Good example of this line of thinking, an old design by the Schlage company called their Everest. Basic pin tumbler lock, but they added this extra little pin in the bottom of the plug, this little what I would call a check pin. And unless you had the right key, the Everest key had a big groove that would reach down and scoop into that, key, that pin, that little pin wouldn't retract and the plug could never turn. So people could sit there trying to pick it all day, trying to set the top pins, top, uh, uh, I can't get it. Well, it's because an entirely different pin was hidden somewhere else. And eventually, of course, a special tool was made. It was a special tensioning you know, tool with a long finger on it. Some people just cut Everest keys and use them as tensioners, very brilliant. But it, it made somebody break out of their comfort zone. If someone waltzed in your building with the basic toolkit that says, I learned how to use this and I'm going to get some locks, would they have, oh shoot, I'm missing a tool, I need a special tool I didn't bring with me, would they need that? Would they need a different technique they have never trained on? That is my definition of high security. Proper high security nowadays, because of, you know, the Everest of course is an older design, you see a lot of sidebar based locks. An entire bar running down the plug that will not fall inward unless other conditions are met. Sometimes it's an entire second row of pins, a whole series of pins, like on this Asa Twin Lock or a Scorpion Lock. Actually, the Scorpion you'll see in a second. The Asa Twin Lock, the idea is it's a whole extra row of pins. You're not going to reach your tools in there and try to set these by the same method. Any people ever have keys for their, uh, maybe their you know, car or something that have a, like a long groove running down the side of it? Have you ever had door keys even with long grooves running down the side? That's usually the sign of what's called a slider mechanism. Same idea. It's small bits of metal, not whole pin stacks, little bits of metal interacting very intricately with a sidebar that has to fall inward. Impossible to pick with just regular tools unless you, know, you have three years to try it, I guess. Maybe you could try. I would not want to. Medico is a very popular lock for some people. If you do any work in the government space, you've probably seen Medico locks around. Again, it's a sidebar-based lock. Theirs, the sidebar actually interacts directly with the bottom pin. The key pin spins into position, allowing fingers on the sidebar to fall inward. If you've ever wondered how that's achieved, it's a pretty neat design, actually. 
The sidebar notch in these key pins is aligned because of these chisel tips. And the actual bidding cuts on a Medico key are in different directions. I took a Medico lock apart, shot some video of it, you know, actually of the plug, and you'll sort of see this. It's a neat, it's a neat system. Here are these little dark spots. Those are the actual channel where these fingers from the sidebar would fall in. And you can see as you pull the key out, it randomizes, flips all around. It's a really, really neat design. Now, it's unfortunate that this design has not really changed in the past few decades. Medico had such a cool design that they were able to coast on it. And they never really did much more research. They never really evolved it, except some cosmetic changes to extend the life of their patents and copyrights. Because of that, one dedicated man and his partner have been attacking Medico for a while and now have basically destroyed the lock. Mark Tobias and Tobias Bluesmanis, if you've never heard of this, they have just wrecked Medico. They can bump Medicos, they can pick them reliably, there are decoder tools. Because they are the lightning rod, they were the big name in the industry. They took a lot more heat than many other companies. But also because they kind of were content to sit around and not make a lot of revisions, you know, they're not, the, they're not an unpickable lock anymore. You never want to use that term in general, of course. But they're not the best of the best. Would I still call them high security? Maybe. You know, depending on how badly, you know, someone has all of Mark's training and all of his special tools, you can get in there. But, I mean, it's, it's not going to be the most common thing. Don't freak out if you have a lot of Medico at your facility back home. If it comes time to change your locks out, yeah, maybe you get something new. Rotating disc mechanisms. No picking, no bumping, nothing like that because there are no pin stacks. Some locks just dispensed with pin stacks entirely. Beautiful type of lock that you see more in Europe than here, except maybe on some of Master's old uh, kryptonite, no, not Master, the kryptonite company's bike locks. The rotating disc, it's essentially a safe. It's like a mini safe with wheels that spin. Now, can you attack this? Yes. You can attack it with a specialized tool, with specialized training, and a lot of time. It takes a while to do. Some locks are what I would call, however, completely unpickable, in quotes, unpickable. Uh, what do I reserve these special fourth category of locks? What is the fourth type of lock, the highest grade? Well, in simple terms, it's a lock that has no known attack or bypass that has been published or even theorized yet. It's a very short list, and it's a very you know, finicky lover. If you're on that list, you can get kicked off right away if somebody releases the right paper at Source or Black Hat or who knows where. Currently, if you're curious, the few locks that really are my darlings on that list, one is a Finnish lock from the Abloy company called their Protec. It is essentially a rotating disc lock that has extra countermeasures, which I'll tell you about if you want to ask me later, that frustrate the use of that you know, rotating disc two-in-one tool. Brilliant design. I used to have Medico on all my stuff. I've replaced it all with Protex in the past. I don't work, by the way, for any of these companies that I you know, praise or any of the companies I trash. Um, they don't give us free stuff. They, they, just, you know, they just are, so I like to remind you of that. I do have friends who sell some of these in Europe, though, and I'm proud to say that they're my friends. They're a very nice product. There are really awesome magnetic locks. Some magnetic locks I would call basically no picking, no attack, nothing has been known. Especially the Eva company in Austria has the MCS lock. Unlike some magnet locks, which are just little north-south magnets in an array, the Eva MCS is actually a lock that has each discrete paddle with a north-south zone rotated into different positions. So the inside the plug, you have these little rotors that spin and align all in a row, allowing a sidebar to interact. It's gorgeous. It's really gorgeous. And anytime you have magnets, you don't have to have the inner side walls of the plug you know, touching anything. It's just a flat channel because magnetism radiates out through the plug and does its job. There's nothing you can even touch with your tools to spin into position. Really, really neat. One more company, Multilock. They're based out of uh, Israel, I believe. Their latest generation of lock, the MT5. There is no known attack or bypass. I didn't get into much of their stuff because some of their older generation locks have been picked and bumped. But the, if you're using a multi-lock system, many uh, North American locksmiths have contracts with multi-lock more than Eva and Abloy. And if you see, oh, we've had multi-lock for the longest time, ask them if they can upgrade you to the MT5 and you'll be in that unpickable category if you want. If you're worried about your safes, don't be too worried about your safes. Well, maybe be kind of worried about your safe if you didn't pay a lot for it. Safes tend to be a little better. Some safes, you know, can be manipulated open. Ask us in the village if we want to teach you about safe cracking. You know, I'm sorry we couldn't bring a bunch of safes with us, but we'll, we, could give, we could give you a lot of fun information about it. There are manipulation-proof safes that are just out there. 
How do they work? Ask me during the Q&A. I hope I'm not breezing too fast. I want to give you all the material. I don't want to run long. And then since we're the last talk, if we have a minute or two, we, we can chat it up a storm or meet me in the bar. Bar. After the startup competition. We're in the startup competition, and then we'll be in the bar. There are automatic safe dialers out there, though. You know, there is something called a Moss Hamilton soft drill. It's basically just a robot that will either brute force the safe or use an amazing series of accelerometers to try to do safe manipulation. To see that in action, it's unfreaking believable. If you're really completely worried about your stuff and you're safe, well, you can always get an electronic dial. The, the Kaba, you know, Kaba Moss Hamilton makes this electronic X series safe dial. Does anyone want to admit to working in a building with one of these in it? Okay. They're sweet, aren't they? They're amazing. The little LED display, it's first a completely self-charging by Zener diode that spins up, you know, it charges it when you're running it, when you're operating it. The little display, for example, will, st will have different speeds at which it'll go through the numbers. So you'd be like 15, 16, 17, 18, and maybe the next pass it'll be like 15, 16, 17, so it's, it's going faster or slower just randomly. If you stop at one number and turn to another number, it'll jump somewhere on the dial and start proceeding maybe up or down from a different direction somewhere else. So no one can kind of shoulder surf you. The, the logic that's gone into this design is just really, really nice. If the dial turns more than one and a half times without stopping, it shuts down. Well, why is that? Well, because your arm can't do that without letting go. And it knows it's a robot dialer and shuts down for a few minutes. It's, it's that type of thinking that's gone into this mechanism. And it's the reason the government continues to use them. It's a great safe. And it whew, costs. <laughs> but I know what some of you are thinking. You're like, what about destructive entry? I could spend all this money on locks, but like me and my neighbors, we don't want to put crazy locks on our houses because we have windows. And my office building has windows on it too. And you know, the door frame is only so solid, someone could crash a truck through it. Well, yeah, they could do that. You can have destructive attacks coming at you. But the thing is, if this guy comes around to try to get into your company, you're going to know this guy was there. Destructive attacks leave behind very clear evidence. Even finesse you know, ones with a bolt cutter or even a drill attack, if a locksmith is using a drill jig, they're immediately obvious. You come in on Monday and you're like, oh crap, someone's been here. Let's execute our policies. Let's put our plan in place. Let's do what we do. You know, you can drill a safe. Sure, this is. <laughs> This is from a safe opening weekend that our friends in Europe host about once a year. Uh, ask me about that too, it's a pretty funny story. But of course, you know, you know it happened. That's what you actually want to have happen. You want to have the person smash their way in if they really just want to get in. If you come in on Monday and it's been a non-destructive attack, well, do you know that that happened? If your front door looks fine, if your home office, if you come into your, your main office after a vacation, and oh, it's, this is how I left it before, if your safe is in the same place, doesn't have any big holes in it. Do you know no one's been in the safe? Do you not know? Well, depending on the grade of lock you're using, you can't just know for sure unless it's a proper lock. You know, different locks will give you that type of peace of mind, that sort of unpickable lock that I mentioned, like the Protec. I have Protex on all of my firearms, especially when I travel. Now, they're small Protex. They're available in different sizes. I have little ones. And someone said, man, well, you know, what if someone cut the lock off? And I said, well, actually, it's a boron reinforced shackle. It's probably not going to happen. But I'll grant you, someone could have an angle grinder. Someone could cut it off. But there's no way they can reassemble the lock if they've done that. There's nothing they can ever do to get in without me knowing immediately when I go to get my luggage. And similarly, the other side of that coin, when I go to get my luggage and the lock is still on there, I hands down know absolutely in my heart of hearts that no one's been in there. It's just that peace of mind factor that you can go for. Basic locks, once again, let's go through the four categories and, and how do I define them and where do you use them. Basic locks, they have no protection. They are a lot of the ones that you buy in a store. They have no resistance to those dummy attacks, shimming, bumping. Anyone can get in. Resistant locks, in my opinion, should not be able to be attacked by the complete no-brainer attacks. They shouldn't be shimmable. They shouldn't be bumpable. But someone could get in with enough dedication. If I, if I have had some training and you're going to just try it, you'll probably get in in relatively short order. Not instantly, but relatively short order. The real level up that I want you to think is the high security lock. Something that, na that needs an attacker with different training, different techniques entirely. Something that goes beyond hardening an existing design and saying, let's actually reinvent the wheel here with a better design. And of course, the fourth category of complete badassery, the unpickable, there's only a handful of them out there. And they have, their, they have their place, you know, if you're really, really doing sensitive work. Where are you going to get them? Obviously, the cheap locks are the ones you find everywhere. 
you can get some of those pick resistant locks at your local, your local shop if you know what to look for and if you can talk to someone who has the right answers or if it's on the packaging. High security locks, you're not gonna find at a local, shore, local store. You, you need a specialized shop. You're dealing with a locksmith at that point. And many of those, if you really want to get into those crazy high security ones, you're either finding an incredibly specialized locksmith or you're just ordering them online. Because a lot of locksmiths simply can't carry that amount of inventory of such a specialized item. Do all these locks have a purpose? In a way they do. You can use a basic lock if you're locking up your garden shed. You just don't want the neighbor kid taking your hose to make a beer bong or something or taking your ladder to steal your bird feed, because whatever, I don't know what your neighbor kids do. <laughs> But, you know, yeah, that's fine. You can have that lock. If you're protecting $10 worth of stuff, don't use the $100 lock. That's kind of dumb. The big secret in the security world that we should all just admit to ourselves is your house. Nobody wants what's in your house. Nobody wants to. If they want to get in there, they're trying to steal your whiskey and cigarettes or maybe your TV. A pick-resistant lock is fine for your house, unless you have a home office doing something very sensitive. Because again, someone's gonna break a window if it's a residential attack. Don't worry about your, your home. Worry about your company. Worry about your storage areas. Proper, you know, high security locks, that's what we're talking about in business. That's what you're talking about in a facility that you might not be back at very often. You wanna make sure it's fine in your absence. And you know, your super sensitive stuff, your servers, maybe your guns, who knows? If you just need to know that no one was in there, that's the territory of that super unpickable version. Are you protecting against force or finesse? I kind of touched on that earlier. If someone's just trying to kick their way in, be mindful of that. Are they just you know, gonna break the door down? Well, then maybe you should reinforce the door in addition. Are they just going to, you know, I'm gonna get my way in really tightly? Then you really need a finesse, you know, a proper high security lock. It's two different sides of that problem. So what is my notion of a proper physical security framework? What would I love to see in an idealized world? What would companies be held to as a standard? Well, you would think of all your facility in terms of three areas. Every door and every access panel would be one of three things. External access, internal access, or sensitive access. External means people without badges and without any credentials could probably bump into it. You're usually talking about your front door. Maybe some outside doors if you have access panels and wiring panels. Internal, that means somebody you would hope went through some process to get where they are standing to see this lock somebody hopefully badged in or was signed in or belongs there in the company and saw well, that's an internal thing for my purposes and sensitive panels and doors that's something in my opinion that's termination worthy if someone is in there and shouldn't be are they terminated if someone else gets in there who shouldn't should the guy who put it in get terminated like set you your server room your records room that kind of deal your executive washroom <laughs> right right off the bat basic locks do not belong in a building and this would be honestly the hardest part if my sort of framework could be rolled into play because you're having plant ops go around everyone's desk and like take wafer locks out of drawers. They do not belong in the building because they encourage horrible habits. The, the user who writes his password and is like, I'm slick, man, I saw that black hats talk. I didn't put this under my keyboard. I'll put my post-it note in my drawer. Woohoo! You know, great. So you have this furniture that you got from W.B. Mason that has the same key on probably half the desks. And even if it didn't, it's a wafer lock on every desk. That just encourages dumb behavior. They don't belong. Every door that you have external to the company, I would like to see high security equipment on those sorts of doors. It's basically, it's not only good be just to resist every bozo coming along, because it'll resist a lot of, you know, tampering. It'll resist a lot of, you know, vandalism. It's just proper for your external doors. Your internal office doors, particularly all your drones who really just kind of get in the way and suck overhead, it's fine. Their, their office door, I, yeah, I, I don't like the corporate environment, you can tell sometimes. You know, pick resistant locks are fine. Someone's not trying to, you know, really just get into, oh, I got to get into Alice's office because I'm going to feed her goldfish and he'll get it twice food. Ah, I'm a rogue rebel. No, I mean, no one, no one is really going into all these sort of doors. A pick resistant lock is fine. Not a basic lock. Put a couple security pins in there, make it bump proof, do it a little right. And of course, those termination worthy sensitive areas, my ideal world, if I could roll a framework out, I would say unpickable in quotes, you know, category four lock should be used. But again, this is just my ideal perfect world. Take all this knowledge and do what's best for you. That's, that's really my, my overall spiel though, is that it should be, you know, any lock you use, you should never have somebody using complete zero skill attacks. It should leave behind signs of tampering. Someone should have to force their way in if they're gonna get in. That's a good thing. 
Of course, this is all only as effective as your people. If you're not trained, I mean, this is what a plenty of other talks you've gone to at many conferences, including Source, before you've heard about. Are you protecting yourself against, is this really the FedEx guy? Well, I don't know, it kind of looks like him, but his truck's not there. Johnny Long, a friend of ours, used this badge for years and years on his red teaming. How long has it been since AT&T has serviced stuff in the field? But he, you know, I'm here, I gotta service your phones. Okay, sir, here is our most sensitive wiring closet. Go nuts. So of course, train your people. What does this have to do with training your people about social engineering? This is a story, let me double check, we're about quarter after, we got a few more minutes, yeah. This is a story from some of my friends in the Beltway. They decided to do a test of their own facility. They were authorized to. But in the framework of what they did, they said, all right, let's assume we were like fired and we came back the next day to screw around. And they, this is the entire thing they were armed with was a BK Tender Crisp and a Sprite. Because they said, all right, how are we gonna do that? Well, just, we'll just roll with it. So Tune and Rob go in and they say, hey, you know, Gerard, the security guard, how you doing today, man? And they, they know the guys, they know, everyone knows the security guard at the desk, right? Hey, what are you guys doing today? Are you supposed to be here? No, no, it's our day off. Oh yeah, I figured it was, you know, because you're not even dressed for work. They had no badges or anything. They said, oh yeah, man, you know, we're just, we're gonna meet, you know, Kate for whatever, for lunch, but he, she's not around. Yeah, I don't know if she's here either. They, at first they said, we're delivering this, you know, to Kate. They said, oh, I don't think she's here. He's like, oh man. Well, you, I mean, they, do they ever give you lunch, man? Come on, and they just started bantering with him. You know, you work so hard. Do you want a BK Tender Crisp? And the guy was so happy to get a free lunch that just on cue, the young guy goes, hey, wait, man, didn't we, gonna, weren't we gonna pick up your laptop today? He said, oh yeah, I left that. Well, where'd you leave? Well, I was running network captures. I think it's in the server room. Security guard badged them into the whole facility, took them into the server room, let them take equipment, which was, I think, officially part of their purview of that test, but they just kind of grabbed a laptop they saw sitting there <laughs> just so they could like say they did it, and like let them out again, all because he knew them, because they were friendly, and because he got a free meal out of it. That's insane. But that happens all the time at all of our companies. You know, training your people to stop someone and actually say, wait a minute, who are you? What are you doing here? Really getting that in their head and then verifying their story, actually following it up with some level of authentication, that's important. I've seen companies with a sign like this internally. And at first I was like, man, that must really encourage a, a, a culture of like angriness when you're just yelling at your co. <laughs> but all the company execs I've talked to, they said, since we did this, it's been great people actually feel like they're taking responsibility for the company seriously. Part of the reason is they followed it up, not with punishment, but with reward. The reason, you beat this with this. You say, there's gonna be in the next six months, someone in here who doesn't belong in here. Whoever finds the person, you don't, don't like, you know, tackle them, and it's just like, authenticate them. If you figure out who it is, you win a dinner at Ruth Chris's or you win a bottle of 12-year Jameson or whatever. Little dumb reward, like this is what, a $75 reward for potentially you just hired half your staff as additional security by doing that. Think about that. Think about all of that. Completely separate from this, but something I love to pitch because most people don't know about it, there is a whole field of forensic locksmithing. Keys inside of locks will touch the pins in a very predictable way. They will wear down the components of a lock in a very predictable way. You can take a lock that's been in the field, tell approximately how long it's been in the field. Well, you can't, you could pay me to. But um, you know, we could tell you how long your locks have been in service. We can tell you if something has been in the lock that is not a key. It is absolutely possible to identify certain scratches, certain marks that are not wear and tear. This is admissible evidence in court in certain instances saying, oh, this lock was clearly picked, this lock was raked, we can tell you what techniques were used. If you have a break-in, and it's a surreptitious break-in of some kind, you will be surprised, maybe, how your insurance company reacts to that news. When they say, oh, we'll send someone right out, show us the door, like, where was, is it off the hinges? Well, no. All right, well, oh, are they, did they come in like a window? No. What, did they come in a roof? Is it missing, show us the, the, the rope hanging down your air vent. And like, no, dude, like someone picked in. Companies will sometimes say, insurance companies will be like, well, this is, no, we're not paying this. You had bad key control. You had bad management. Of, you had a rogue employee. Actually being able to verify that, no, someone with no skill, you know, stood there, ripped this lock up, or even someone with really good skill is going to leave a couple of marks, marks that are documentable, marks that you can testify about in court, all because tools will touch pieces of the lock where they shouldn't normally be able to be touched. 
it's really, um, it's a field that I found amazing when I first got into it. And now uh, I and a fellow named Datagram out on the West Coast have done a lot of really cool research in it. He's the guy people turn to out there. We're here on the East Coast. If you ever have weird questions, it's a, it's a real, real eye-opener when you think of even bumping. I, show if you, I used to think, oh, bumping is like a key. It's going to just touch what a key touches, right? That's like, ooh, forensic problem. No, bumping pounds the crap out of locks. Bumping will jam all over the place in a lock. And there's marks like that as well. You shine the right light on something, you really zoom in, you'll see awful dents. These are all pieces of evidence that you can submit. And many times, my friends, especially in Europe, have had testimony that's turned over on discovery, like just cases just get dropped. They're like, oh, okay, never mind. Yeah, you guys had someone actually picking their, we didn't think that actually happened outside of like James Bond films. Okay, here's your check, please. Potentially, really a lot of economic impact and if you understand this, that's, so that's why I wanted to throw that in. It's something that most people don't even know is a field. But knowing that this information and evidence is out there could potentially save you a lot of money. So I boop, pop that little bit of knowledge in your noggins. Other than that, which locks are which? Which locks are you know, different categories? There's a million of them, as I say. There are plenty types of manufacturers out there. These are just a small list of my favorites. Ask me later which ones are which. I can talk to you forever. I will bore you talking about locks before you know, we run out of booze at the bar. But does, does this, some of this making sense? Is it, is it kind of clear? I'm not putting you to sleep at the last talk of the day. You're a real quiet crowd. I'm not used to the, to the non-black t-shirt crowd. I hope everyone, <laughs> there should be beers out there. I should hear bubbles blowing and things. OK. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for listening. I want to let you have some questions. Yes, sir. Quick question on the forensic side of it. Mm -hmm. What would be the implement, implications of, say, a softer than steel pick, like, say, something like Zytel mm -hmm. or something along that line? Does that still show up? Or... Gadsden adds, what if you're using non uh, steeled metal or just softer material to pick? Many times. One of two things will happen. Either A, the picking is completely frustrated, like the, the pit tool just bends, or at a mic real microscopic level, like you're using bore scopes to detect this, you'll get material transfer. You'll get material in the lock, a little fibrous material that does not belong at all, and you can at least document that. Yes, sir. An attempt versus a success, very good question. Not usually. The question is, can you tell just from the forensic side whether something was successful? Um, there would probably be ways like, let's say, a bypass. If someone uses a shimming attack or something like a real no-brain attack that will either just always succeed and be like, all right, someone knew what this thing was. Clearly, they stuck it in the right place. I imagine they must have gotten in. Or if marks, let's say again on a shimming attack, if marks are far enough down inside the shackle retention latch, I'll be like, well, if this person didn't get in, then it's like they opened the lock and walked away because clearly the tool was in the right place. Most of the time, no, you can't tell. And you're, you're relying on something like, oh, we've got crap missing. This stuff was here and now it's not here on Monday and this is in the lock. I imagine those aren't two separate events, but that's, that's the answer there, hopefully. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. I think the one lock you sort of mentioned was, would you say the self-powering safe dial was the one question you had? That is definitely in the category of locks that have no known attack whatsoever. And at that point, you're like, even if the, the best person, fully legit, with you know, no one's going to stop them, and they're called out to your facility, they're going to disassemble the lock. They're going to rip like the door out. Uh, so yeah, is the, is nothing is you know fully unpickable like marketing style, but there are some things like unpickable like in quotes. Yes. That's a fascinating, that's a really neat question because you don't think about it that often. The gentleman says, can something be too secure? Can you either be so secure that you're locked out? Or a really neat question you said is, what about extra keys? Some companies, it's really hard to get duplicate keys. So if you need them, you probably have them already for new hires. What do you do with them? I would put all those kind of you know, keys, like I have, a lot of my keys are in one of my gun safes, actually, which is behind an abloy. 
or in a safe locked with, you know, a Moss Hamilton. The idea of what if you get locked out, in my opinion, you should have already, like, that should be in your business plan. The idea of, like, what if my company burns down and I'm down for, like, two hours? Do I have a satellite office? What if I am just locked out, locked out? It should be, can we have at least one skeleton crew inside to let us in? And if not, can we afford to have a locksmith? Do you have a locksmith on call? Like, it's like having a lawyer on call. Because, again, destructive entry, your servers will keep running fine with a big hole in the drywall. Like, if a drive dies in a raid array and you're like, oh, crap, that dude's in Aruba. We can't get in. Kick the wall down. You're supposed to be there. No one's going to arrest you. <laughs> so uh, there was one hand there, and then you, sir. What kind of legal grief do we get from publishing? Uh, fortunately, not as much as some software guys do. Uh, the DMCA, I imagine, could be used to apply to like a crazy crypto algorithm in a lock, but I've never seen it really applied to like research discussion. I know locks, lock companies a lot of times don't like the sport picking community. Uh, sometimes, you know, they'll just outright slander people in the press, like Ingersoll Rand owns Schlage. Uh, we like a lot of Schlage products. It's very painful to see how they could utterly just trash the picking world in, in the popular press. In Europe, it's not like that. In Europe, you have companies actually coming to the picking community and say, hey, we made this. What do you think? One lock that I didn't put in the unpickable category but probably belongs there, and I should take some photos of it, is called the RKS lock by Stanton Concepts. It was a lock designed open source from the ground up. He came to the hobbyist community. He came to the hacker world. He's like, I got this idea. What do you think? And he's been at tool meetings and stuff for years. And it's a, it's, it has to do with container shipping, uh, shipping container security. It's great. But has there ever been a really bad lawsuit? Not from a manufacturer, usually. Sometimes they will say, no, 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 you completely misrepresented us. And they'll try to sue that way. But not like you're giving away trade secrets. Because, dude, it's hunks of metal. Like, I didn't, you know, I didn't reverse engineer your code. I just, I put a, like a, a Dremel tool and I cut the lock in half and I took photos of it. That kind of thing. And there was, right on, there was a question here, yes. Yeah, kind of follow up to the one about locking yourself out and that's that probably more procedural. Mm -hmm. But you have to have agreements with, for instance, a fire department. Mm-hmm. It's an excellent point. You should definitely ask me uh, in a bar for a full story. But what you're, he's, he's saying, what about for procedures like fire access? Uh, there are municipal codes, in fact, in many instances that require you know the fire company to get in. You know, you know, in the day, back in the day, they used to just have like an axe, and then they would have what because they were, didn't want to get sued if there was a false alarm. They would, have, and there were more and more false alarms with everything wired up together. It's not just smoke coming out of a window. It's like, oh, the ADT panel's blinking. We got to get out there. So then they would have big key rings for all their clients. Like there was the town key ring and that you did not want that laying around at the firehouse, which is hosting like my super sweet 16 on the weekend. It just, I wouldn't want my key ring there, would you? So what they use now is something called a Knox box. It's a real interesting piece of technology. It is capable of really neat security. The idea is it's a, a high secure lock on a, like embedded in the concrete box with your key behind it. So the, at your facility. So the fire company has a, has a Knox key which is usually universal throughout the whole state. They don't like you to know that. Uh, it's, there's there's the, the one Medico key for every 50 states. That's being changed slightly. And then eventually they started to say, well, this is sure is insecure. So they had the keys were restricted, which doesn't mean a whole lot sometimes. And in the cab of the, of the fire truck, it's actually a unit called a key secure, which on the nice version, it takes DTMF tones over the network to authorize the removal of the key. But the biggest thing you can do if you're interested in that kind of field is ask if your Knox box is wired into anything. Many modern Knox boxes actually have a, a trip sensor, a read switch, and you can have it as part of your system. You can log that event. You can have it set off alarms. If the alarm's already going off, I mean, fine. But if someone plays with a Knox box and get it open because they have the fire key, I mean, you should set the alarm off. Most of those are not hooked up. Because think about when those get put in. Like, you're pouring concrete. You haven't even hired your electric guy yet, probably. But if you have a facility that's putting a Knox box in, think about that too. We are really tight on time. Is there one last quick question? All right, you, sir, and then we're all going to go to the startup, and then we're all going to go to the bar. Would yes, sir. The newer electronic locks in which category? That's a way bigger question than I would have time for here. But we'll each buy each other a drink, and we'll talk about it all in the bar. Does that sound good? All right. All right, yes, yeah, so a two drink minimum for that question. I approve of that. You, sir, get one of my first drinks. All right, thank you so much, guys. Thank you.